Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the fourth session of Seafood Canning Technology. In the previous sessions, uh, for understanding of this particular subject, uh, we have divided into three components, which is the concept, the container and the process. We have described it as a CCP. So, in the previous sessions, we have discussed regarding the basic concept of this technology and uh, the last session we discussed regarding the container and in this session, we will be dealing with the process. Other than headspace, uh, another important uh, part that as we discussed that uh, in a particular solid pack, uh, solid contents are provided and also liquids is also provided. So, there are different kinds of additive that is used in the canning technology for two purposes. One is for, as we told that liquid uh, will assist in filling the gaps, providing a, a normal uniform thermal conductivity and additionally it provides according to the filling material that we use will manage or balance the flavor of the product it, it impart a, a characteristic flavor a characteristic color etc to the material so different kinds of additives are used so sardine can be used you can see that normal thing is brine the fish can be processed for some tuna in brine is an example and tuna can be also preserved in oil and also different kinds of uh, curry gravies can be added, different kinds of tomato sauces can be added. So these are the different kinds of liquid media that is used as an additive. In the case of salt that we use also we need to follow certain standards that is the BIS standard that is available which is uh, IS253 which is the standard that determines the quality of the edible salt that we use. So such because uh, only salt that uh, qualify that standard needs to be used for addition uh, to the canning material. And also when we are preparing brine, we need to be, make sure that we use the pickling salt. Pickling salt is basically normal sodium chloride without iodine. So non-iodized salt needs to be used because if you use iodized salt, when we prepare brine that after thermal processing, the brine may look as a clouded uh, liquid. So that kind of cloudy appearance can happen if iodine is applied. So that will basically deter the consumers, like think the consumers that the product is uh, spoiled or something like that. It may impart spoiled look to the product. So to avoid that, to maintain the clear brine solution even after the thermal preservation, we need to make sure that the non-iodized salt is used for preparation of the brine. And even in the case of oil also, the particular oils need to be avoided. Different kinds of oils impart different flavor to the product. So in the case of canning, we generally prefer neutral oils or oils does not carry its own characteristic flavor. Like sunflower oil, which is a basically a neutral flavored oil. It can be used for uh, oil preparation of the different kinds of canned products. And in the case of sauces that we use, uh, the normally tomato sauce is used. But uh, the sauce also need to have 20 to 30 percent solid content in it so that uh, to prepare a uniform consistency product is available at the final. And also in the case of sugar, also different kinds of sugar is used. Uh, then pectin is also used in the case of color retention in acid foods. So a huge range of additives or chemical additives are there which are approved additives like uh, FSSAI approved additives are there. There are different codes are given for example sodium nitrate which is coded as E252 which is a normal preservative and color fixation agent that we use. And there is also potassium nitrate is used which is coded as E252 which is also a preservative at the same time it is a thickening agent in soup. And there is erythrobic acid is there E315 which is an antioxidant. There is also sodium erythrobate which is basically the synthetic uh, isomer of uh, vitamin C. This also it can be used as an antioxidant. And also phosphates are used, different kinds of phosphates such as uh, phosphoric acid which is scored as E338 uh, which is an antioxidant and sequestrant uh, chelating agent as well. And also there is sodium phosphate which is uh, coded as E339 which is also an emulsifier, humectant, sequestrant etc. So these are the various uh, additives that is used in the case of seafood. And also in the case of crustacean based uh, canned products also there are different uh, range of uh, chemical additives are used, uh, especially potassium phosphates are used which which is coded as E340, which is used as, as an emulsifier and a humectant, etc. And there is also calcium phosphate is used, generally used for similar purposes. There is magnesium phosphate, which is used as a stabilizer, thickener, etc. which is coded as E343. And there is also sodium acid, phyrophosphate is used, SAPP, which is like preventing struvite formation we use. We also we use sodium tripolyphosphate or STPP as a humectant. Humectant means basically it uh, helps in maintaining the moisture content, protects the moisture content of the product. And there is also poly, different kinds of polyphosphate, E452 coded uh, polyphosphates are added, uh, calcium di dirodium is also added, E385, uh, which is also like, you know, a sequestrant or a chelating agent like uh, ethylene diamine tetra acetate. Uh, so, such a, like EDTA can be used. And there is also saccharine or sweet is used as general sweetener, which is coded as E954. So, 
these are the different kinds of uh, approved chemical additives which can be added uh, in the canned products the next process is going to be exhausting the container the exhausting is one of the important process uh, in the canning and uh, it is basically removing the air or and other unwanted gases from the head space so it is basically different kinds of exhausting procedures are thermal exhaustion or heat exhaustion hot filling etc it is there mechanical exhaustion is there and also steam injection is also there see so these are the various uh, exhausting procedures that we use and also hot filling is basically what we use is that you do not have any uh, exhausting machinery available we can uh, follow the hot filling procedure in hot filling what happens is the liquid that we are going to fill the container is in hot condition for what happens is that the steam that is coming out from the hot liquid will eventually replace or push away the hair from the head space when it is sealed the steam will condense and when it is cooled and the steam will condense and create a perfect vacuum uh, within the container so that is what hot filling is called and also steam injection is basically nothing but using steam nozzles we are injecting steam into the head space through the container lid so there are proper steam injecting machines are used this uh, particular care is taken while steam injection machines are there and also there is vacuum sealing machines which uh, suck the air outside the container and seal it uh, simultaneously it will seal the container and also proper pressure needs to be maintained as well exhausting is basically removal of air from the container head space as we discussed earlier so before exhausting what happens is lid is just placed on the container which is called the lidding so if single seaming is there if no double seaming is there this is also known as clinching so a clinching procedure is applied so it is called it's before double seaming it is a clinching procedure because only a single seam is provided it is called clinching uh, after lidding a normal clinching is provided to the container so that the next uh, before double seaming so clinching is done because some kind of gap is provided within the container body and the lid material and the lid and the can body there is a small gap so that a proper exhaustion of this like for example if it is a vacuum sealing or he is steam injection etc proper exhaustion can be provided so proper gaps can be provided for that so uh, like it is basically minimizes the strain on the container due to air expansion so this kind of exhausting is very important because it will uh, minimize the strain on the container due to the internal air expansions it removes oxygen which facilitates corrosion and oxidation that is one of the main advantages of exhaustion procedures also it creates a vacuum so like on cooling what happens is the cannons become concave otherwise uh, immediately after the processing uh, stage because of the expanded stage of the internal gases steam whatever it is uh, the cans will have a convex uh, shape but when it is cooled down all the steams is going to condense and a proper vacuum is created and finally the cannons uh, needs to be concave so this uh, the final concave nature of the cannons is an indication of proper exhaustion procedure also so that is very important in the case of hot filling uh, what happens is that uh, a liquid is filled uh, it is in a medium or a hot condition medium hot condition uh, steam replaces air it also helps in heating time as well and vacuum inside the can is generally made in 20 to 45 uh, mm of uh, mercury that is a normal vacuum pressure that is maintained inside the container the mechanical vacuum sealing machines are there steam injection is uh, like, like as we discussed steam is blasted into the head space after exhausting the procedure the immediate process that is going to follow is the can sealing of the process the session in which we discussed regarding the container we also told that how a double perfect double seam is very important for the proper uh, protection of the indian internal raw material and if you take a cross section of a proper double seam there is going to be five metal layers including two can body and a uh, three lid after double seaming the can the can needs to be properly coated so that uh, the batch uh, the process etc can be properly identified can coating is uh, earlier we used uh, proper embossing machines but uh, what happens is that embossing machines tends to uh, damage the container because it is basically pushing the metal stretching the metal part so it may also damage the external lacquer internal lacquer the, the tin coating of the container so now it is usually the laser coating is used or uh, container inject uh, cij process is used which is called as container inject uh, processing laser printing is also used laser coating is also used and also now barcode qr codes etc are also applied so that uh, in the container the metal engraving is minimized by mostly the concentration given on the particular barcode or qr code provided so there is basically can embossing was initially prepared then there is a container inkjet or cij is used and also laser printing is used to read a particular can the coding inside the can is also very important the first letter usually 
determines uh, what month it is indicated and the last uh, two digits of the year is followed by that and also day of the month is also marked and then the facility code is marked then then the production line can is also code is also marked then the the time is also marked so this is the a particular the can code which is embossed or printed over the can surface will provide uh, this uh, kind of information after can coating uh, the can needs to be properly washed because uh, after filling the container some of the material may be over spilled after the sealing so that oil uh, fish pieces or uh, sauces etc may be attached to the outside of the can container which needs to be removed so if it is not removed what happens is uh, after the processing or cooling after the thermal processing it may solidify and it may peel off the external metal layer as well so that proper can washing is uh, required so there is also can washer with oil reclaimer is also available and also can washer with dryer is also available the can washing is one of the important process because cans leaving the seaming machine will have either oil uh, it will have brine sauce etc or pieces of fish on the surface because uh, generally we use high speed canning machines so that uh, conditions may occur so such cans if not washed can may contaminate or uh, clog the retort either contaminate or clog the retort these are food materials basically so if uh, they are placed in the retort it, it can result in subsequent uh, contamination of subsequent batches also there then uh, stick fish pieces could peel off external can lacquer printing whatever was printed on the surface it also prevent label from properly sticking on the container that is very important and for washing generally a hot detergent solution is used it is around 1 to 1.5 percentage sodium polyphosphate at 80 degrees celsius this is the solution that we use and also uh, finally hot water wash is provided to remove the detergent as well otherwise the detergent uh, will create an alkaline corrosion so after uh, washing it with detergent a um, hot water rinse need to also need to be gone uh, so before processing can washer with oil cleaners are used and after processing can washer with dryers are used after washing the can properly the most important process is basically thermal processing or heat sterilization so basically what we do is uh, enclose food inside a container seal it uh, fill it with proper filling medium maintain uh, proper head space seal it uh, properly and then wash it properly then proper heat is applied and pressure so it is basically time temperature combination for every product proper time temperature combination need to be standardized we need to apply ideal temperature for ideal period of time so the time temperature combination is going to depends upon type of the food the type of container medium of heating whether it is saturated steam water steam air mixer etc also type of the machinery that we use so the purpose of thermal processing or thermal sterilization to achieve uh, commercial sterility so what according to who or fao commercial sterility of low acid foods is defined as follows commercial sterility means the absence of microorganisms capable of growing in the food at normal non refrigerated conditions at which the food is likely to be held during manufacture distribution and storage so this is the standard world health organization fao definition for commercial sterility so thermal processing basically application of heat for a particular period of time at a particular temperature that is what we mean by time temperature combination which depends upon the type of the food or machinery the type of the food in which we are aiming to achieve commercial sterility so according to the commercial sterility that we need to achieve in a particular type of food this time temperature combination is going to change the heating medium that we use is steam the transfer of heat is by condensing the phase change is there it has a good latent heat capacity is there by condensing what happens is it generates more sensible heat hot water is around 500 watts per meter meter squared degree celsius that may be the latent heat capacity of a uh, hot water but in the case of steam is around 10000 watts per meter squared degree celsius so that much difference is there using hot water and uh, steam so steam has much more latent capacity and it can uh, transfer heat more successfully than a liquid so hot water and oil are examples of heat mediums that heat by lowering their own temperature what happens is when you use hot water or hot oil the oil basically transfers the heat to the colder body by reducing its own temperature so but in the case of steam steam transfers its uh, the heat that it carries by condensation or phase change so that is why the latent heat in the steam is released instantaneous so instantaneous release of heat is there so the heat transfer is much faster in the case of steam compared to hot water or oil so using latent heat or steam heating for heat transfer is far more effective than utilizing uh, sensible heat or hot water or oil heating as much higher amount of energy is released in a shorter period of time so the steam has different properties like uh, property and advantages that steam heating is rapid the advantages improved product quality and productivity 
and also it has a property of by controlling the pressure we can control the temperature so the advantage is temperature can be quickly and precisely established and also it has high heat transfer coefficient because smaller required heat transfer surface area enabling reduced initial equipment outlay so this kind of uh, advantages are there because of the properties of the steel properly heating and the can product different kinds of machineries are used we generally term it as retorting machinery or retort so uh, retorts can be classified in different methodologies different ways it can be classified based on orientation the retort can be classified as horizontal retorts and uh, vertical retorts and according to the method of heat or pressure apply it can be steam retort uh, water retort and air over pressure retort and according to the movement it can be either static retort or agitating retort and by the process it can be either batch or continuous retorts so retort is basically like a, a advanced form of normal pressure cooker that we apply the normal uh, pressure cooker that we apply in the kitchen for normal cooking procedure is also a kind of uh, retort but uh, the pressure is limited but in the retort a standard retort more higher pressure can be applied so if we consider a normal parts of a retort the normal vertical retort will have a pressure gauges are is going to be there temperature indicator is going to be there pressure regulator is there then control panel steam inlet so these are the basic uh, components on a normal retort normal vertical retort but in the case of air over pressure retort what happens is an additional compressor is provided to provide this air over pressure that we we already told that in the case of flexible and semi rigid containers we need to provide an additional air pressure of uh, 5 psi other than the normal 15 psi so that which can counteract the increase in internal pressure expansion pressure of the container so that this uh, flexible and semi rigid containers will not burst during the process so that is why in the case of air over pressure retort we use an compressor air compression additionally to create this additional air over pressure so a commercial air over pressure retort line will have a retort assembly will be there normal retort assembly will be there then there will be additional boiler will be there to provide the steam and also additional air compressor is also going to be there and there is going to be a water cooling system for or water cooling tower is going to be there to for with water inlet and outlet so that the product can be cooled uh, efficiently and different kinds of commercial retort setups are there like vertical retorts are there horizontal retorts are there steam air retorts are there then water immersion retorts are there water immersion retorts basically we use uh, in the case of water immersion uh, superheated water is used around uh, 122 degrees celsius the water is heated and that superheated water is uh, finally used for heating the containers the advantages of water immersion retort is that steam is used to heat the water and then the superheated water is used to heat the container so advantage is that uniform heating is there and other uh, the time is also comparatively less uh, that is uh, the advantage normal steam retort only steam is there steam air retort means uh, the additional air over pressure is provided mixture of steam and air is used and also there are continuous retorts are there where the containers uh, there is a continuous lever system is applied where the containers is passed continuously without any breakage in the process so that the multiple number of containers can be processed a large number of containers can be processed uh, given a period of time and there are also hydrostatic uh, continuous hydrostatic sterilizers was uh, also used where uh, high hydrostatic pressure is used to create instead of steam pressure high hydrostatic pressure is used uh, for uh, applying particular pressure so that a particular temperature can be applied and also agitating retorts are there and in the case of agitating retorts uh, we use different kinds of uh, rotation one is side over side rotation is there and also end over end rotation is also provided and cooling and drying is one of the stages is very important because uh, rapid cooling has to be conducted to a temperature of 35 degrees celsius is very important because the presence of geobacillus stereothermophilus which basically it is a thermophile and is widely distributed in soil hot springs and ocean sediments and is cause of a spoilage of in the food products by producing various organic acids and no gas is formed and it creates flat soil spoilage it will grow within a temperature range of 30 to 75 degrees celsius but optimally at 55 degrees celsius spores of geobacillus stereothermophilus may enter a cannery in soil on raw foods and in ingredients such as spices etc their presence in some processed containers of, of commercially sterile low acid foods may be considered normal and not of particular concern because although geobacillus stereothermophilus can grow at higher temperatures the spores will not develop if the product is stored at temperature below 43 degrees celsius so because of this presence of geobacillus stereothermophilus the cooling procedure is very important it should be brought at a rapid uh, cooling towards 35 degrees celsius to prevent the geobacillus stereothermophilus uh, to evaporate what happens is that if the cooling is not done if sufficient time is provided by cooling 
to re reach the temperatures during that 55 to 40 degrees Celsius, which is the ideal temperature for geobasilar spores to multiply. So what happens is that it will create ultimately create in flat source spoilage if the cooling is not rapid. So the rapid cooling has to be done. And also only up to 35 degrees Celsius it is provided. The reason for cooling the can containers only up to 35 degrees Celsius is that one intention is that by rapid cooling, the temperature is not maintained at, the, at that uh, critical zone where the geobasilus serothermophilus uh, is the ideal temperature zone. So it is quickly passed through the zone and also uh, to, uh, sufficient heat is maintained to evaporate the remaining water. So like you know, so it will provide and uh, facilitate an effective drying of the material. So that is also very important. So uh, what happens is that uh, if proper cooling is also important because immediately once the steam is cut off to initiate the cooling procedure internal temperature keeps on rising. So if uh, internal temperature keeps on rising, it will result, if rapid cooling is not followed, it will result in overcooking of the product. That is also very important. So rapid cooling to 35 degrees Celsius is usually achieved using chilled chlorinated water is used, chlorinated water up to 2 ppm is used. So what happens is that uh, chlorinated water is not used, what happens is that, that there may be percolate microscopic pores on the seal, the part which is used for double seaming is filled with a rubber containing sealing compound that we already discussed that rubber containing sealing compound is used once it is heated what happens to the rubber containing sealing compound is that it will become soft and it will allow small microscopic water to enter during this particular stage so if the water used is not chlorinated it may result in a post process spoilage because uh, other microorganisms can enter with the water in, inside the container and make spoilage so preventing this post process spoilage only we use chlorinated water and there are also other methods like a pressure cooling is also used pressure maintained while cooling using air that is one uh, pressure cooling when steam is cut off to prevent the can distorting due to the sudden pressure drops so pressure cooling is also another method for rapid cooling method that is used for cooling the container and also the final method is that can labeling and storage is very important proper labeling there are proper labeling standards available throughout the industry as determined by FSSAI and international standards, uh, national and international standards are there. Uh, proper labeling standards need to be followed. And uh, the ideal temperature for can storage is around 10 to 21 degrees Celsius. And uh, immediately after the processing, the cans are basically stored up to 14 days so that any kind of a post process uh, spoilage can be detected. And then for storage temperature of 10 to 21 degrees Celsius is the ideal storage temperature for canned products. Why this uh, before marketing or uh, before uh, transiting the products after production, a period of 14 days incubation period is provided so that any kind of post process spoilage can be detected and uh, which can be corrected uh, and which can, could be traced back to the process and which area the, the defect can be detected, traced back to the area where it occurred uh, so that the corrective action can be incorporated. So other than uh, heat sterilization, pasteurization is also one of the technique, uh, heat preservation technique that we use. Pasteurization is a process in which uh, water and certain packed and non-packaged foods such as milk or fruit juice etc. are treated with mild heat, usually to less than 100 degrees Celsius to eliminate pathogens and extend shelf life. So there are different kinds of temperatures are used like uh, any temperature that uh, we are using above 100 degrees Celsius is called as a thermal sterilization temperature. And any temperature that we use below 100 degrees Celsius generally termed as pasteurization temperature. So therefore, there are different kinds of pasteurization methods are there for common types of pasteurization techniques used for pasteurization milk and other liquid products. There is a low temperature long time process or LTLT process which is generally around 63 degrees Celsius for around 30 minutes. And is also there is high temperature short time HTST process is there. It is generally 72 degrees Celsius and it is for 15 minutes uh, average. And also there is ultra pasteurization which is uh, 138 degrees Celsius and for 2 seconds and there is also ultra heat treatment UHT treatment is there it is around 140 degrees Celsius for 1 or 4 seconds. So these are the different pasteurization techniques that we use. And also in the case of different varieties of seafood are also heat sterilized seafood are also there and there is also pasteurized seafood is there. So there is uh, crab is one of the pasteurized normal variety that is called blue crab. The pasteurization temperature is around 121.1 degrees Celsius, the pasteurization time is around 10 minutes. Then caviar, the temperature is around 68.3 to 71.1 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes. There is also crab, uh, dungeness crab is there, it is around 88.9 degrees Celsius for 90 minutes. Also smoked salmon is pasteurized for 85 degrees Celsius for 90 minutes. And it's also surmi based imitation crab meat, 
91 degrees Celsius for 20, 25 minutes. So these are different kinds of uh, time temperature combination that we use for pasteurized seafood products. Pasteurization can be in general divided into two, like you know, solid food pasteurization and liquid food, food pasteurization. In solid food pasteurization, that is both batch pasteurizer as well as continuous pasteurizers are used. On the other hand, in the case of liquid food pasteurization, usually heat exchangers are generally used. The heat exchangers are two types. One is direct heat exchangers and indirect heat exchangers. So batch pasteurizers are machines uh, which can use a limited number of uh, material and uh, each batch the machine has to be stopped, uh, the container needs to be opened and the batch uh, needs to be removed and additional batch needs to be added. That is why I call this called a batch pasteurization. And also there is continuous uh, pasteurizers are there where the process is continuous, continuous unlimited number of uh, containers can be pasteurized at a time. Large number of batches can be continuously processed. One is indirect heating methodology as well as direct heating methodology is used. In the case of indirect heating methodology, the liquid that we need to pasteurize does not come in direct contact with the, the heating medium, the, which is uh, usually the steam. The, the passage of steam and passage of the pasteurization liquid is uh, between two different uh, walls. Just basically the stainless steel tubes or uh, walls, uh, cabins, stainless steel structures and through these uh, stainless steel walls only the heat is transferred from the heating medium uh, and to the uh, the processing liquid. That is what indirect heating is uh, all about. In the case of direct heating, what happens is that uh, direct steam is uh, cold liquid is uh, sprayed towards a, a continuous flow of direct steam and actually the steam and uh, the pasteurization liquid comes in contact basically. So that is why it's called direct heating. The heating medium directly comes in contact with the liquid or the food particle. In the case of indirect heating, it does not come in direct contact. So that is the difference. In the case of direct heat exchangers, uh, the common exchangers that we use is bubble column heat exchanger, cooling tower heat exchanger and as well as spray condenser heat exchanger. In the case of indirect heat exchangers, there is plate heat exchangers where uh, the heat is transferred through the heated plates and that is called plate heat exchanger and there is called, also called tubular heat exchangers where the heating medium as well as the processing liquid passes through tubes, uh, stainless steel uh, concentric tubes. Either it is can be through plate surfaces or tubular surfaces. Another form of uh, pasteurization is the aseptic packaging or, or tetra packing technology or other, otherwise it is known as the ultra high temperature short time processing which is uh, another form of pasteurization or high temperature short time processing. Basically it is used for uh, liquid products such as milk etc. And regarding in the container session we have already discussed particular characteristics of the tetra pack that is used for uh, USGST process. The general principle of a common aseptic uh, packaging system is that cartons are formed from a roll of packaging material which passes through a sterilizing bath containing a 35% solution of hydrogen peroxide at 70 to 80 degrees Celsius and the packaging material then passes through rollers and a curtain of air at 125 degrees Celsius which evaporates the solution and also serves uh, to increase the rate of sterilization. The film is formed into a continuous tube sealed along the longitudinal edge and the base of carton is then formed by a transfer seal. Milk from aseptic storage tank is filled into the carton under aseptic conditions uh, maintained by a heater and, uh, and the carton is sealed by another traverse uh, seal which also forms the base of the next carton. An appropriate cut along the traverse seal separates the carton. So this is a process in which a proper seal is formed in the case of aseptic packaging. Aseptic packaging the basic concept is that both the packaging container as well as the, the material or the food is uh, aseptically or sterilized at different conditions and they are packed together under sterilized conditions. So both the product and the container merges together in a sterilized uh, aseptic uh, zone which is uh, individually sterilized. So then the filling and sealing is uh, processed and an aseptic enclosure is formed. So that is why it is called like aseptic packaging te technology and it is also known as uh, tetra packing technology. Thank you.